Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Shea Station podcast. It's Friday, April 5th. The Mets are in the win column, just probably not as much as we want them to. They win yeah. one game on their six-game homestand, uh, but there's plenty of season left. I think we're like 2% in or something like that. So we're going to do our best to spin it in a positive light because that's what we do here on Shea Station. Uh, but, you know, there's some worries in the air. There's some apprehension, but I think uh, – I think there's a lot to like from these first six games, too. Jerry, how are you doing? I'm lovely, man. How are you? I'm pretty good. I had an eventful week this week, as you alluded to before the show. I had a trivia event on uh, on Wednesday. We sold it out. 80 tickets no, sold. No, Jolly. We did it. You did, my oh, friend. Oh, come on. Come the king on. of baseball trivia. I guess. JM Baseball's own Jolly Olive. Yeah, it was a really special event. Um, I, a lot of people told me that... Uh, they had a great time. They didn't realize how good everyone would be. I didn't realize it either. I think I made the trivia a little too easy. Uh, lots of drinks were drank. A lot of food was eaten and a lot of questions were answered correctly. Uh, so hopefully we get to do something like that again. Hopefully you'll be in New York or something. You can stop on by and, you know, maybe chop up some ref guests. Uh Did you just pull a T-Pain right there? A little drink. bit. I was. I would. I wasn't going to call it out though. You drunk him, got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I saw. I was following along on Twitter. I'm so pumped. That's awesome. That's a a lot goes into that, which oh, yeah. is behind the scenes stuff. So I appreciate what you guys did there. Nice to see you, uh, Mr. Doyle there. Oh yeah, and the umpire yeah. getup. I want to get the We Got Ice Boys involved in some way, but making them answer questions would have been too tough. That ended up being the perfect thing. We had them just make safer out calls. Yeah, good, man. So I liked uh, I liked it. That's a cool event. Um, so if you guys are Mets fans, want to come meet the Jolly Olive, uh, I'm sure you're going to do another one because it was a success, correct? I guess so. I, I'd love to do it again and uh, get more people out there. A bunch of people uh, didn't buy tickets within the first week and it sold out. So they are going to, I guess, be on it next time. Who knows? But love that. It's nice to open with something positive because uh, in the week since we last recorded where we did our Over Under episode – a lot has happened in Mets. A lot land. of and unders. A lot yes, of unders. A lot of unders so far early in the season. Uh, it's not going to be like last year where we're going to go through full game recaps and all that stuff. We're going to hit the headlines. We're going to talk about the bright spots, the low spots, and just kind of keep a fluid conversation. Um, so, I mean, we can start at the beginning. We can start with the most recent win. Uh, but I guess just your overarching thoughts on what we can honestly consider to be a very disappointing homestand to start yeah, the year. Yeah. Um... I'll start with kind of the the big scares, the lineup. Yeah. It's scary. It, it looks tough. I'm going hood up with you. Yeah, please do. Thank you. I need a partner. <laughs> I, my hood, I'm hanging out with my hood rat friends. Yeah, I know. Dark uh, times. Alonzo, great. I'm not worried about Lindor. He looks good at the plate. Mm, I am worried about McNeil, though. This feels like McNeil struggles. So you you would think a guy like that would be able to swing his way out of it, but I am worried. I'm I'm worried about McNeil, but outside of that, like the offense isn't performing. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not worried about Nemo. I think he'll come on, and I'm not worried about Lindor. Um, positives though. Beatty looks good offensively yes, and defensively. Yes, he does. He made some plays, and he didn't panic. There was that play at the plate um, where he, he was in the fifth it. game. Yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. He bobbled it and then made a great throw home to, to get him. Smart decisions, showed poise. I like that. Uh, the other worry is some spot. So the lineup, the bullpen looks worrisome. Uh, our boy Ottavino, I know he can iron it out. Tonkin looks tough. He hasn't had a positive outing like that. Um, a lot of weak contact, though. So a law of averages, everything is falling negatively. So you think, like, especially offensively, once these at-bats start to accumulate, the problem is a lot like in 22 and some last year. All these guys struggled at the same time, and nobody's picking each other up. Um, Alvarez is trying his part, but there's few and far spots between. Um, 
the most positive thing for me is Jose Budo. I really like what I saw from him. I loved what I saw from him down the stretch last year. And he carried it over. He had a great spring training. He had to make a spot start. I don't know. Did you, are people aware why he, they signed to Ron and why he wasn't the guy that can be called up is because of the time that he got optioned down. He's not allowed to be called back up without a, without a major change because of certain things. Oh, okay. And so with McGill getting called up or with McGill getting hurt, he could be that guy. There's just, he wasn't allowed to be called up without not burning his option. So there was some issues okay. there. But I like the Tehran sign. It's depth. He's a big league pitcher. Not yeah. not your 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 big name, but I like what I saw from him. Edwin Diaz looks great. Brooks Raley looked really good. Um, Reed Garrett looked incredible. Kind of saved really, the game yesterday. He really did. He really yeah. did. Those three innings were key. And he looked really good doing it. Um, I want to talk about Budo for a second. Yeah, do it. This new regime that came in for the Mets, his what the the again, I'm not a prospect guy. Sure. But the overarching thought about Jose Budo was he's a very good pitcher, triple A fill in, doesn't have the stuff needed to be sustained successfully in the big leagues, has a good changeup. He's afraid of the strike zone. His fastball, it won't play in the big leagues. And he doesn't have a breaking ball good enough to have that sustained success. He's changed the narrative in my eyes and in a lot of people's eyes about what he can do in the big leagues. He got a lot of swings and misses on his fastball in fastball counts. Granted, the, the Tigers aren't the most amazing lineup, but they do have some young stars, which shined a little bit against us. But he got swings and misses on that. And I think there's room for growth for him because he misses a lot of pitches on his off-speed stuff way out of the zone. So when he can when he can shrink that those uh like his change up makes it more effective in when he throws that big breaking ball, which I think can play, and he's not yanking it out of the zone, he starts to get more confidence in his ability to throw it in the strike zone. I, I really like what I saw from him. So I think that's a positive. When you have extra starting pitching that can be effective like that. And he's young and under team control for a long time. Yes. And he feels comfortable. He's finally at a place, I think, where he's comfortable in the big leagues. That's what I saw. I saw poise on the mound. Do you remember back uh, in Oakland last season? I remember most of that because it for me, it was a growing, a growth area um, for Kodai Singa. Right. Because Struggled, learned some things that he had to do on preparation. I think Jose Budo pitched in that series, and he pitched really good, but it was five innings, and he escaped, and he was like, done. And he was like, gosh, I made it through. I'm so happy. One of those young guys in the big leagues that's like, good, I did my job. I'm, I'm out. I saw a different thing last year, and I saw it in his eyes and his mound poise this year. He wants that ball. He wants to go long. He wants to go CG shutout, which is the mentality that you need, especially from a starting pitcher, that when he has a good outing, it isn't like, hooray for me. It's like, right. that's what I wanted to do. I meant to do that. That's what I can do on a regular basis. So I'm I'm big Budo fan right now. I love everything you said. I love that you took the the kind of overarching question. You made it about a bright spot, which was Jose Budo giving us six innings when we had, I think, two fresh arms yesterday. Um, you mentioned that first start in Oakland. It was his debut. Uh, Ten base runners in five innings, one run allowed. So I get what you're saying with I escaped. I made it through. But Budo had a really nice end to last year. He had a 3.27 ERA in 27 innings. And then he added a uh, kind of the sweeping slider in spring training that he was displaying. But like you said, his fastball was the thing that was working the most yesterday. So took advantage of a huge opportunity. And it's cool because the Mets' depth got tested really quickly with this McGill injury. And it's showing how this pitching lab is kind of changing the outlook of the guys that are not considered in the top five. And the thing with this entire start to the Mets' season, them being one in five, is that their pitching has been good. Like their pitching has not been a problem 
at all. They have the fifth best team ERA in baseball right now at 2.84. I mean, I'm sure we'll get to it, but Sean Manaya's start was incredible. Hauser looked yes. good in his debut. They pulled him at the right time, I thought. And the bullpen back three of Diaz, Smith, and Raley have gone nine innings with no earned runs, 11 strikeouts to two walks. So, I mean, that part of the Mets game is working, and I'm we're seeing good at-bats from guys like Brandon Nimmo, who just haven't gotten the results. Nimmo still is top five in walks in baseball right now, despite, you know, hitting under 100. So I think it's just a case of the Mets having, you know, the worst possible homestand possible. There were mistakes made and games to be won that I think, you know, is on Mets management and is on the players. Like, you know, we can't all attribute it to bad luck. The Mets did not play well this past week. Um, but I think it's not this, it's not, not to rag on another team in the division. It's not like the Marlins where I think we're 0-8 and, and there's really nothing to point at and we got these all these injuries. Like The Mets had a lot of things go right this week. It's just they didn't get all the wins that they could have. I think we could have easily been 3-3 three and three or something like that and gone into this road trip feeling better. Um, but I think pitching being this effective early on is really encouraging to me. I think that's a great comparison to where our what I didn't do that. Yeah, I mean, thumbs down immediately. Uh, this, after I'm this done crazy. Talking. So <laughs> the yeah, um, the comparison of the Marlins I love. Like just off the top of my head, both dismal starts in the win loss column. They, it looks like a long journey that is impossible to dig themselves out. The Mets do have a lot of positives and a lot of ways to push forward. Um, if I were putting my eggs in either basket, it's an easy Mets for me there sure, because of course. you can see a light at the end of the tunnel there. And the losses are heartbreaking. Like they're, you know, extra innings, all that kind of stuff. But the holes that you see, Jeff McNeil has one hit. Harrison Bader, you know, Harrison Bader struggled and he's got three hits now. Marte looks okay. He looks okay. Doesn't look super dynamic. Um, Brandon Nimmo is he's got one hit, but his at bats are the same. I like what I've seen out of Nimmo. I'm not worried about him breaking out. I'm not worried about Lindor breaking out because he's putting together decent at bats. Um, but huge bright spots are Francisco Alvarez. I think he's the key. And then uh JD Martinez is kind of on we don't know when he's coming up. My guess is help. Atlanta. That's my guess. That's that's what it seemed like when Carlos Mendoza was speaking. He was hoping for earlier. They were praying for earlier because of, of the losses. But I think J.D. Martinez knows what he needs to be ready in the big leagues. And he'll be there ready to go when he gets up there. So I'm not done on the season. And my sarcasm on Twitter, season's over. Um, I think a lot of people hit it. I know uh, Nancy and MJ, they, they <laughs> laughed at it. Um but then you you talk about the the Rayleigh looks great. Diaz doesn't have his consistent strikeout stuff yet, but it's right there, and he's still throwing up zeros. So I love seeing that. Um, I I'm excited. I I think they've they've got some some good runs in them. So I, I I'm the offense will come around. I hope um, McNeil again. I am very worried about McNeil. Um, to me, that's the separator is can McNeil figure something out because he, he can't hit like he has been um, and the team to have success. So outside of that, though, you know, I think there's some there's some positives to be made. Um, Jorge Lopez looks pretty good. Um, like I said, Rayleigh, uh, out, but Drew Smith looks pretty solid again. You know, there's still hope for Drew Smith to be that guy and Reed Garrett looked great. So, uh, and then you got Deekman there as that second lefty with Rayleigh that can throw up some zeros really fast. So um, one in five, is that the record right now? That is the record right now. Yeah. And so uh, I, it's not the end of the season, obviously, uh, but it's positive moving forward. What were, what were your takeaways from the first six games of the season? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really good to get in the win column. I think that was, Part of the reason why it, it felt like the sky was falling is just because you didn't have one in the W column, and now you do. So maybe that'll change the fortune of the Mets or at least get a monkey off their back. Um, but at the start of uh, your conversation there, you mentioned, you know, the kids, Francisco Alvarez specifically. 
he's been the biggest bright spot because I think the expectation for him was let's take a step, you know, let's 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 get above league average, let's maintain good at bats, let's not chase out of the zone. He is doing a little bit of that, which you know I think comes with the excitement of him doing so well at the beginning. There's some three two pitches he could have taken, uh, but overall, I mean, eight for twenty with a home run, four RBIs, and the third best OPS among catchers in the first week of baseball is incredible. It's all you could ask for. And he's already found his way to the cleanup spot. Um, speaking on that a little bit, uh, the lineup shifting has been a bit much for me. I don't think we've seen the same lineup more than once this season. I would like the Mets to get into some sort of rhythm here. I don't think that happens until J.D. Martinez joins the team. And then I think Mendoza can construct the lineup he's really wanted since the beginning of the season. But there's been a lot of, you know, flux there between double headers and extra innings and getting guys well, rest Tell me, on. Tell me what you don't like about who's moving around. I mean, to start with, you know, Alvarez hitting seventh on opening day, and then a day later he's fifth, and the day after that he's cleanup. Um, you, you do your best to try and keep, you know, some semblance of rhythm in the top of the lineup, but with the Mets hitting woes, I understand wanting to shift things around, but we're six games in. You know, these guys have to get their feet under them. Uh, I think the only guy that's really stayed in the same spot more than once are Nimmo and Alonzo at one and three. Um, so I'd, I'd like some consistency there. If you're not going to hit McNeil cleanup, I'm fine with that. Keep him in one spot towards the bottom of the order. That's what got him going in 2022 when he had his great season. Um, but really the offense right now is just running through Pete Alonso and Francisco Alvarez. Talk about another just clutch moment from Pete Alonso, who's just seemingly built for the moment. Uh, every time we need him, he's there. The pitch that he homered on off Alex Fido was I think a foot off the ground is what Sarah Lang said, which is the most like Mets swing for a homer ever or something like that. Um, just an unreal swing. I can't believe he had the power to get that out. And that, you know. Yeah, and he put it, yeah, where he, where he put that. That was. Yeah, like that wasn't a scraper. That was out to left that's center the field. Thing, that's the separator between a guy like Pete Alonso and other guys that hit home runs. That's not a home run for 99% of the rest of the league no matter who's hitting like that's a that's that's rare rare company there yeah and you see the Mets 0 and 5 and you see that guy come through I'm sure uh, Steve Cohen and David Stearns have to be paying attention to that and thinking about that because that's going to be you know a looming thing over the entire season what are we going to do with Pete Alonzo um, but I can't you know stay all positive here as much as I'd like to because the Mets are five losses deep and a week into the season <laughs> Uh, a big thing for me, man, I know we're talking about Lindor, McNeil, and Nimmo. They're a combined three for 60, and, you know, that's just not going to cut it at the top of your lineup. Um, the Mets bench has been a non-factor. In fact, they've been a negative factor. They're a combined one for 24, which is a 0-40 batting average between Zach Short, DJ Stewart, Omar Narvaez, and Joey Wendell. There's been errors in the field by our defensive guys in Short and Wendell that have cost the Mets games. Um, it's sloppy play. It's really upsetting to see because I was excited for some of these guys to see what they can do. Uh, and it kind of makes you think, boy, I wish the Mets had Luis Guillorme right now because he kind of does all that and hits a little bit too. Uh, now he plays for your arch rival. So really disappointing week from the Mets bench. I would have liked to see one of those guys kind of pop up and seize an opportunity because they did get decent playing time this week. Um, and everything will shift around with the rise of J.D. Martinez. So who knows who gets sent down? My guess is probably D.J. Stewart, who's still hitless on the year. And he's gotten his opportunities. And I think he's deserved them from how he played last year. But at the end of the day, you know, the big leagues is a cruel business. And, you know, if you get a week of run and you're not there, that might just be it. So I'm not sure what the future holds for him. But getting a zero batting average out of your DH is just not going to work. You know, this even if it's just the first week of the season. So, again, the key thing is the offense needs to come around because the pitching has been doing its job. Although I am worried because we do go to Cincinnati next, and that's kind of uh, the grand equalizer for this kind of thing. You know, the hitting will come around, the pitching might not. So really curious to see where the Mets land, but it's going to come down to those top three guys. So Francisco Lindor, Jeff McNeil, and Brendan Nimmo. You need to get at least one of them going if you're going to start to win these close games. Yeah, you nailed it. Um Joey Wendell was brought in to be the Guillaume replacement with right. some more thunder. He hasn't looked apart. The air, brutal. He he's looked tough out there. I hope he irons it out because he's very capable. Right. Um, there's a reason why you were excited about him coming over. You thought, you know, maybe a little bit of a change. Yeah, the bench, the bench 
<sighs> That's tough. It's tough seeing yeah. your guys put up and it, it wasn't, they're, they're non-competitive at bats for the most part too. And so um, when you're getting negative production from that, that's when your offense is already struggling. That's tough. That, that's going to, that's going to bring you down. And then, yeah, they go to Cincinnati, a tough ballpark with some decent pitchers that they're going to face. Um, yeah, this should be kind of a battle because this is uh the Reds are a young team. Uh, that looks like they they want to compete and they've got a couple of guys hitting really well, but they're also struggling offensively. So we'll see. They're they're four and two on the other end of the struggles. They haven't put it all together, um, but this will be a good matchup. Frankie Montas is doing in a red uniform what the Yankees had hoped they traded for when they right. got him. He looks great in two starts. Ashcraft has looked solid. Abbott looks good. Um, there was a, done his thing. there was a really good foolish baseball tweet uh, about Montas about I think you played with this guy, but how similar his career arc is to Sonny Gray right now. Started with the Oakland days, was fantastic. Got traded to New York, couldn't figure it out. Goes to Cincinnati, is great. That might be the path for Montas. We'll see. But I, I thought that was really interesting. But the Mets that won't is. see him, which is nice. I think they're gonna they're gonna dodge the ace of the Reds. Um, Listen, man, if this is a high hitting series, I think I'm all for it because, you know, I think um, like Quintana and Severino, surprisingly enough, they were uh, the least impressive starters of the first turn of the Mets rotation between Budo balling out yesterday, Manaya carrying a no hitter into the sixth inning, and then Hauser, you know, doing what he does, which is just kind of dealing five, six quality innings, you know, managing contact and all that stuff. Um, I was at the second game of the season against the Brewers, and I, I watched the Seve start. Definitely a lot of soft contact. I think they uh, they overturned the the Zach Short hit into an error, which saved his ERA a little bit. Um, but it was just a lot of living in the zone, not living in the chase area, and serving up a lot of pitches to hit. And if Seve's going to be this guy that attacks, 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 uh, the stuff has to be better, or he needs to just, I think, locate better. But again, that's a hard adjustment to make in the middle of the season. I'm still hoping, though, because the, he was still throwing, you know, 96, 97, 98 on that fastball. There's something there. There's still electricity in that arm. Uh, but it's a tough turn for him because now he's going to have to pitch in Great American Ballpark against a really good lineup. This is um, – so the I'm going to – I'm looking at his splits here to, to sure. see if my eyes matched what actually happened. But he might be tipping still. He might yeah. be giving away his pitches only in the windup. Yeah, because they were jumping on his stuff when there was nobody on. It seemed like he was in the stretch basically the entire game. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm okay with because he looks consistent out of the stretch. He looks like he can tack his velo doesn't go anywhere. Um, my internet's not working great, but the the fact that he can do it out of the windup I think is a good sign that he can turn this around. Because bottom line is, if you can't do it out of the stretch, just go on the wind or or in the windup, just go in the stretch the whole time. If it eliminates your problems and you have you're having a hard time fixing it on your own, just get rid of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, in a very small sample size, uh, the opponent's batting average against against Severino uh, is much higher with bases empty than it is with runners on. Which you know, take that with a grain of salt because I think Correct. you know, One when, start. It rain, when it rains, it pours, and and that kind of start where you give up eleven hits in five innings. Uh, but at the same time, I, I kind of agree with what you're saying. I think his his pace was a little bit better. Uh, in the stretch, he just looked a little bit more comfortable. And I don't know. It was, it, there was kind of just some bad juju in that second Correct. game, too. Like we with the Hoskins situation from the day before, the way they handled the Hoskins situation, which I still don't agree with. And I think they I'm were kind of trying to shed that off and just move on, which I think I am as well. It's been talked about to death at this point. Yep. Um, but And you don't see the Brewers again until the last series of the season. But that's the biggest thing I'm looking out for in this Red Series is how does Sevi look? I think we know what we're going to get from Jose Quintana at this point. He's a he's quality star Quintana. He'll go five or six, keep the game within reach. And then Manaya is something to really be excited about. But that game too, Luis Severino versus Nick Martinez. Can we get some runs on the board for him like we did in game two? That was our highest scoring game of the season. We still lost. Uh, and can Sevi, you know, get through five innings without being – you know, hit to death at this point with a pretty good Reds lineup on the other side. Yep. Uh, Quintana, Hunter Green is a good matchup in game one. Yeah. Sevi, Nick Martinez, I think you would hope that's in our favor. And then Manaya Abbott. Manaya is very positive. I loved what I saw from him. Is a continuation of the guy 
that we think he can be. Um, obviously, we don't expect him to take a no hitter deep into a game every outing, um, but the ability to miss bats is the separator for him. And he looked really good doing it. Um, this is a big series for their offense. Can they find some semblance of consistency? They don't have to put up eight, nine, 10 runs every time, but no more. I mean, how many times did they go one, two, three and just weak contact, strikeout, strikeout? You yeah, know, I mean, at some point during the doubleheader yesterday, they went 12 consecutive innings without a hit, which is unacceptable. I mean, even, yeah, even if you want to blame it on on luck and we're, we're taking these quality at bats, we're getting hard contact. Um, that's a signifier of just making things too easy for the opponent. Like, you know, taking too many first pitch strikes. I feel like I saw so many Mets hitters watch a fastball pour in, you know, first pitch for a strike or, you know, chasing out of the zone deep in counts. There were a lot of walks that could have turned into punch outs. I think it's just they're getting their feet under them and I, they're getting warm, but you, you can't use that as an excuse for too much longer. I think Mets, Mets fans are already in hysterics over that in the first place. Uh, but 12 consecutive innings without a hit, that's the biggest stat that stood out to me because that's just not what we saw from the great Mets baseball we saw two years ago. You know, every at-bat was a battle for an opposing pitcher. They had to sweat out every single time throw at least four or five pitches just to get through a Mets hitter. Didn't matter who it was. And they kept the line moving. But when this domino effect of futility infects the entire lineup besides two guys – um, there's no way you can strain together rallies, you know, and you don't have this power hitting lineup where you can just pop a home run and, you know, get back in the game. You had that yesterday. You're not going to get that every game. Uh, so really hoping for just better at bats, more competitive at bats, which I think we've seen, but it needs to be more consistent. Yeah. I think that's the the nail on the head. There is competitive at bats. Can you put pressure on the defense? That's what they did so well in 22. They worked the starter, no matter who it was, no matter what caliber starter it was, they grinded them. They got the pitch count up. They made them work. They made the defense work to make plays. And that's the absence of what we've seen in the first two series. I think that's the key for them, especially with the way their lineup is. Lacks that power. Yeah. You got to have guys coming off the bench that put the ball in play. You got to have guys at the top of the lineup put the ball in play. Jeff McNeil has to put the ball in play. Lindor is going to come around. Alonso looks locked in. If this is Alvarez, the the guy that we have that we think he is, you have a chance to do some damage. Offensively, that's the key. And then if Severino can step up, you'll be a real competitor because he, at his best, can be elite. So. Yeah, I mean, if you get good pitching this series, great, but I, I wouldn't rely on the performances you've seen this past week uh, to you know be repeated. Um, but I think that there, there's a formula for Mets success and getting five good innings from guys they can rely on. And this bullpen, which you know I didn't get to mention this before, poor Michael Tonkin, uh, four innings pitched, two earned runs, eight runs total six unearned runs for the poor guy who had to pitch an extras twice had the Wendell error you know it's a, a tough start for him hopefully getting away from City Phil can help him out but you have arms you have arm talent we knew that's kind of what Stearns was capable of and bringing to this roster but now the guy's got a hit man the kids are here they've been doing great shout out Brett Beatty I feel like we didn't talk about him enough but the adults they got to get it going yeah they're not the baby Mets anymore more like toddler Mets yeah they're, they're growing up they're grown up, and uh, I would put that as a, a real positive thing that they got last year was a lot of guys to just get some experience, and now you're going to start to rely on them to be more consistent at the plate. Alvarez needs to be consistent. Even when he's not producing at the level that he is now, he's still got to not just completely disappear from, yeah. from the lineup to where he's just a hole for a while. Uh, Beatty, too, has to be consistent. Um, yeah, but I think overall – you can't win every ball game one nothing. You can't lose every ball game three to one. You got to be able to put up runs. You have to put up four consistently here, um, and they're going to need consistency. So uh, I don't mind the lineup changes. I think McNeil struggling as bad as he is, drop him down to the nine spot, put him in the eight spot, Why whatever not? the case may be, and then let your guys that are their thunder, let them bat more regularly. So. Yeah, I, I like what I've seen from certain guys. I need a lot more from some. Um, if you can pitch like this, you're going to be competitive. 
this is a 500 ball club with this pitching the way it's been. If they can start to hit consistently, which I think they're capable of, um, they're going to be competitive. But they they just it's a tough start. For yeah, Carlos Mendoza getting his first win on Game Six, um, but hopefully that opens the floodgates a little bit of bottleneck, and now you see start to pour it on, got it out of the way over that hump, and they're they can go up there with confidence now. Uh, before I let you go, we 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 didn't mention Mendoza a whole lot this episode. Do you have any kind of impressions of him from his first week as a big league manager? Because I think uh, it's as tough of a first week as you can have, not only starting out one and five and chasing that win forever, uh, but also getting bombarded by New York media after every single game. Like, what did you see anything specific from Mendoza this week you want to call out? No, I think he he did a good job handling the media, answering the questions the way he showed poise. Um, and we're only six in, so we'll see how it goes. But I like what I've seen so far. I, I did not enjoy the McNeil Reese Hoskins situation. Yeah. I thought McNeil, I didn't like the slide. Yeah, it might have been legal. I did not like the slide. McNeil, if you're going to throw up that big of a fit, go after him, man. Start yeah. a fight. If you're going to do it, do it. Do it yourself. Yeah. Don't bring the manager into the situation, don't make a pitcher get suspended. If you want to fight, fucking fight. Excuse my language. But if you're going to bitch and complain, take care of it. Yeah. Because then you're going to get one of your own guys hurt, which thankfully didn't happen. You're standing right there. If you don't like it and you think he's a a dirty player, show it. They'll get your back more instead of making them do it. Do it yourself. Um, I thought he should have been hitting his first at bat or thrown behind. Yeah. Uh, Even if you're not going to hit him, send a message like, hey, dude. Next time, slide into the bag, not through the bag. Yeah. Again, I don't, I don't love the slide. It wasn't dirty, but get out of there. Like uh, to me, that's on McNeil. Do your thing. If you're gonna fight, fight. If you're, if not, then just keep your mouth shut. Yeah, no, I agree. It, it, it puts Mendoza in a pretty impossible situation in his first game. I do still think, you know, it could have been handled better, a lot better in the second game. Throw yeah. high and tight. Send a message. Be on your way. I think Ron Darling just had a great week in the booth in general, kind of nailed God, everything on the shocking. head. The least yeah. shocking part about that of course, is of course, the but Mets booth was excellent. His quote of uh, you can't throw out a guy after he's already beaten your head in, I think was very emblematic of that entire series. The Brewers came out the other side looking much better in every facet of the game, defensively, yeah, offensively, that, and just as a team. Of course. And that, that reminded me of the um, of the Padres playoff series where – Oh, yeah. Yeah, where you go out and and show Walter waited until what the fifth sixth the inning. sixth inning yeah yeah the sixth inning to go out and and check for substance when he should have done it in the first if there's questions go get it don't wait until you're getting your butt kicked to to throw up a fight or to to throw the red flag out there do it early do it often if you have a problem face the problem right away and if not move on because yeah. then you're gonna clown yourself doing it too late. He uh, Mendoza said that Johan Ramirez didn't throw at him. That's what you have to say. I agreed, but I I disagree. If if that's why, if you if Severino, it was it Sevi. It was yeah, uh, Sevi, right? Well, Sevi started, didn't throw at Hoskins. Johan Ramirez did. Sevi has to do it. If you're going to do it at all, it's got to be Sevi, and it's got to be as soon as you have the opportunity with an open base, or don't ever do it. Yep. So that message has to be sent. He has to take control. If it was on his own, you go address that as the manager and say, that's not the time and place. You don't do something like that until I okay it, or you get the okay from a coach passed down from that um, because you put him in a tough spot. Um, outside of that, there's everything that could go wrong for the most part did offensively. Pitching was great. There's positives to be had. And I think um, I think they'll be okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hopefully a week from today, uh, we're spinning a much more positive light. The Mets have gotten hot in some capacity because uh, there's things to lean on, things to draw from that are definitely positive about this team. Uh, they need to get a couple of wins in Cincinnati before they go to Atlanta. That's as simple as that. They need to get some positive offensive stuff going before they face the the big bad wolf of the NL East. and. That's yeah, and the how, interesting part. How about this big bad NL East, by the way? Uh, the first place team Braves are three and two, and then every other team has kind of gone off to a really sluggish yeah. start. Man, two and four for the Phillies and Nats, one and five for us, zero oh and eight for the Marlins. Yeah. So what we, happened to us? We know we know the Phillies will be fine. 
they don't they're they're not going to chase victories in panic because they've proven you know that that they can get it done in the long run so i'm not worried about that the marlins look atrocious and non-competitive the nationals will be non-competitive they just don't have the pitching staff to be able to handle it regardless of how good their offense is even if they <laughs> they don't have the offense either but he, no matter how well they're pitching or hitting it does it's not going to matter but yeah the mets are that third team that if they stink then this is a joke of a division so oh yeah absolutely so i mean the braves might actually go wire to wire in first place because they're first place the first day of yeah. the season um we'll see with all that maybe the mets can put a dent in that lead uh, a week from today uh, Jerry, I'm going to let you go because I know you had a hard out. I'm going to wrap up the show with some probables, but uh, shout outs to you. Loved your thoughts on the Seve and uh, the Hoskins situation and all that stuff. And hopefully this time next week, we got some more fun stuff to talk about. Yes, sir. I'm I'm in. So let's talk positive again, and then I'll see you in a bit. All right, everybody else. So just want to do some quick overarching thoughts before we wrap up Shea Station today. Um, as we alluded to before, the Mets are starting a three-game series in Cincinnati. Tonight, they face off against Hunter Green. Look out for Pete Alonzo, who has fantastic numbers against Green already in his career. Two home runs and six at-bats. Lindor and Bader also have a home run, as well as Brandon Nimmo and Tyrone Taylor. So hopefully, the Mets can catch up to that heater and uh, put up some good at-bats against uh, Hunter Green, you know, the prototypical ace of the Reds. The next day, Luis Severino and Nick Martinez face off. Both of them kind of with rocky starts to the season. Both of them going five innings pitch, three earned runs. Not a lot of great offensive numbers from either side in this matchup. Hopefully we get a good start from Seve. Hopefully I'd like to see him get into the sixth inning, you know, throw that fastball with a little more confidence, nibble the edges a little bit more. We'll see. Because if you live in the zone against the Reds, they will hammer you. We saw that in their previous series against the Phillies. So, in the final game, Sean Manaya, who carried a no-hitter into the sixth inning, has a zero ERA on the season, will face against lefty Andrew Abbott. Not a lot of experience from the Mets side against Abbott in general. Jimer Condelario has faced Manaya a ton, 13 at-bats with an 837 OPS. So look out for that matchup as well. Uh, guys, I know it's been a tough week in Mets land. We did our best to spin out the positive things and, you know, address what was negative. Uh, if you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you leave a like or subscribe on YouTube if that's where you're listening. If you're listening on a podcast app, consider leaving us a review. All these things really help out. Uh, we're so excited to be back. Uh, the normal schedule of Shea Station, Jerry won't be on every week. He'll be on bi-weekly. I asked him to come on this week because of how or the Mets start was, and I really wanted to have him on here to kind of ease the fan base. Next week, I have a very special guest from Braves country who will be on to recap the uh, Mets and Braves series, as well as the Mets Red series that is coming up. Uh, but again, if you guys enjoyed today's episode, please leave us some feedback. We'd really appreciate it. And keep your head up. I know it's a one in five start, but the Mets are too talented to be this poor of play. I think it was just, you know, the week where everything that could go wrong went wrong, but there's still a lot of positives to take away between Manaya. Hauser and Budo, you know, the back three in the bullpen of Diaz, Smith and Rayleigh, Alonzo and Alvarez are absolutely slugging the ball. So if just a couple more guys fulfill their role, I think things can turn about pretty quickly. But if you're down and dejected right now, I am as well. And it's very understandable. And hopefully starting tonight, the Mets can get hot again and uh, turn those frowns upside down. Thank you guys for listening to Shea Station. I'll see you at this time next week and uh, have a great rest of your day.